Hello everyone, I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library and I am happy to welcome you to another edition of the website chat. I'm going to immediately turn everything over to your state librarian, Jenny Stapp. Jenny? Thanks, Joe. Thanks for joining us. It's a snowy Friday here in Helena, but uh, I'm grateful for it. The ski hill needs some snow before I'm ready to go skiing up there. Um, I do have a number of things I want to talk about. I want to continue the conversation we've been having about the Montana Library Network and what that might look like in the future, the commission discussion we had a couple days ago and where we think we're going with that. And then also give you a little bit of a preview of what we're hearing about the upcoming legislative session. Um, before we get to those topics, really glad to have Randy Tanglin, the Executive Director of Humanities Montana with us again, as well as Kim Anderson, also from Humanities Montana to give us uh, an update. Randy, I'm just so glad that you want to continue to participate in these events. I think it's gonna be a great way for us to continue communicating uh, between our different communities. So, welcome, glad to have you. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Jenny, for having us here today. And I especially want to take this time to thank you, Jenny, and the Montana State Library and each of the librarians uh, in the audience today for everything that you've done to keep libraries and culture and literacy and data and facts all alive and well in Montana during this global crisis. And I think it's, you know, I've, I've always known this, but it's just become more apparent to me that libraries truly are an essential service to our Montana communities. And I know that you folks are on the forefront of interacting with and providing support and comfort and stability uh, to our Montana communities. And perhaps to aid you in those efforts, I just, I want to remind you that we are still bringing our Montana Conversation speakers to libraries around the state. Um, many of our humanities speakers have made the pivot to virtual conversations and they're just waiting for your invitations uh, to give a program at your library. And uh, we've even waived the $75 copay for sponsors um, and for the sponsorship on year end for virtual programs during COVID. And, I know that the Butte Public Library, the Belgrade Community Library, and the North Valley Library in, in Stevensville, among others, have all had very successful virtual Montana Conversations programs in their libraries and events in the, in, in the recent months and weeks. And I thank uh, all of you for your partnership on those Montana Conversations. Um, I think I may have mentioned when I was here last time, but for those of you who I haven't met or had a chance to introduce um, myself before, I just joined the, the Humanities Montana team here in June, and I, I actually left college teaching. Uh, I've been teaching at a college for 12 years before I came to Humanities Montana, and the reason I left that life to join the Humanities Montana team is because I believe so passionately as I, I know all of you do about the role of the humanities and, and culture in our communities in civic engagement. And um, as part of a, a healthy democracy, um, I believe uh, most of you here already know the wonderful Kim Anderson, the Humanities Montana Director of Programs and Grants. And I'm going to turn things over to her to tell you about our democracy project. This is a funded program to support youth and civic engagement in community libraries. And I really couldn't be more excited about this project and I hope many of you will want to be involved uh, with it in, in the coming months. So I'll turn things over now to Kim. Thanks Randy and Jenny, uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, Humanities Montana is very excited to partner with Montana State Library to offer a series of workshops coming up for librarians who would like to enhance their library's positions as hubs for civic engagement and interactive programming. So in the weeks ahead, we're gonna be working with Amelia and Joe and others at the State Library staff to come up with a format and times that will work best for all of you. But we wanted to get on your radar right now and, tell you, and give you a little preview of what we're talking about. Um, the workshops will be on Zoom. 
uh, but they will not be lectures. They very much will be workshops. They'll be experiential and they'll feature facilitated conversations, researching, planning, and executing group actions, and analyzing together what works and what doesn't, and what you might be interested in trying in your community. And a little background on why we wanted to engage in this work now is um, that we've been receiving more and more requests for support for civic engagement work. Sometimes community groups come to us wanting help holding a difficult community conversation. For instance, in Red Lodge a few years ago, they, they were having a big disagreement in their community about the flying of a Confederate flag. Uh, sometimes coffee shops and breweries want to partner with us to hold current events discussions with their patrons. Teachers are looking for civics resources and libraries have been more and more looking to us for more interactive Montana conversations programs. So as a result, we've been trying to improve and increase that kind of programming. And uh, one of the programs that we're eager to introduce, for instance, is the Democracy Project which will put teens together with their local libraries and HM staff to choose an issue in their community like low voter turnout or uh, unequal access to technology, maybe. Um, and then the librarians and HM staff will help them research the underlying causes of that issue and come up with plan, a plan to affect some sort of change. Um, libraries that sign up for that program will receive funding and additional training, but it occurred to us that other librarians might be interested in using some of these same strategies to enhance all different kinds of programming for both adults and youth. So as I said, the format times and topics are still being hammered out, but we hope to begin the series in mid-January. Um, and our workshop leaders have signed on, and I think they might be familiar to some of you. We'll be working with two longtime HM partners who have a lot of experience facilitating and working with adults and youth. Um, Lowell Yeager, our past Montana Poet Laureate, has been leading civic reflection conversations for years, working with groups like Montana Conversation Corps, the American Civil Liberties Union, Montana Public Television and Radio, uh, MSU and UM. Um, and then he will be partnering with Julie Edwards, who has 15 years experience as a librarian in public and academic libraries. She has an MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois, and has worked, published, and presented internationally on issues related to librarianship and information. Uh, Julie likes to say that she is passionate about helping individuals think critically, especially when it's unfashionable. So those are gonna be our two team leaders. Um, our hope is that we can strengthen our relationship with some of our most important programming partners, librarians, that we can learn more about the issues concerning your patrons, and that together we can further establish libraries as hubs of community building. So we hope you'll join us in 2021 for these workshops. Uh, we'll be in touch soon with more information. And again, our thanks to all of you and to the Montana State Library. Thanks, Kim and Randy. It sounds like just a fantastic program and, and something that will address concerns that are on all of our minds, that are very much on the minds of librarians in our communities. We appreciate you reaching out to us. We're really glad to be a partner with all of you. Um, just wanted to ask if there's any questions while we have the two of you with us. Well, this is Joe, and I just want to ring in. I've been to one of Lowell's library presentations mm -hmm. that was hosted by the Browning Schools, and it was amazing. And I know Julie, and she is amazing. So I think this will be amazing. Joe, was Julie the one that helped us with the, the, with the or that we worked with on the Shakespeare? What, I, what am I remembering? She, she um, the circulating. She, 
Yeah. The 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 um, suffrage uh, panels was Julie's work with us. Okay. Everybody remembers those. They um, they traveled. There were I don't know five of them. I think five panels on uh, women's suffrage that traveled around Montana the year that Montana women the centennial celebration for Montana women getting the vote, which of course was ahead of the rest of the country because you know we are. Yeah, she did. A, she did. She's um, she's also a very frequent presenter at MLA. So a lot of people have seen her before. She'll be great. Great. Well, again, thanks for being with us, Brandy and Kim. You're welcome to hang out with us if you have the time. Um, and I look forward to doing this again in the future. Thank you so much for having us, Jenny. And I think Kim and I are going to jump into other Zoom meetings and, and phone calls. That's the Thank way so the, the days are going these days. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Happy holidays to you both. Yes. You too. Yeah. Right. I'm going to share some updates from the commission meeting that occurred this last Wednesday. And as I, as I always say, those meeting materials are available online and I hope you'll take a look at them. Uh, there's some key actions that the commission took that uh, you should all be aware of. Um, first, we've rebooted the process to update the public library standards process you all know that that's been on hiatus for a little while as we were going through the pandemic and wanting to take time to reflect on what we've learned about how the pandemic is impacting the future of library services to make sure that as we think about the public library standards that we're doing so in a way that takes that into account and, and to help make sure that those standards can really be future focused. So we do now have a, a second major revision to those draft public library standards available for you to review on the commission website. Um, Tracy led the public library standards task force. They met a couple of times this fall to hammer out some of those major revisions that I think take into account well much of the feedback that we heard from all of you in the spring when we were going through the public comment period process on the, the first draft of those standards. So um, some of the changes that you'll see in the revised draft, most notably is that what we are proposing to include in administrative rule is just those essential standards. Uh, what is an administrative rule right now uh, that you're familiar with are the essential, enhanced, and excellent standards. By having just those essential standards in administrative rule, it gives us more flexibility to continue to modernize and update and encourage good library development through enhanced and excellent type standards without having to go through a major administrative rules process. So to be clear, uh, if the commission ends up adopting the current proposed public library standards or, or something along the same line, libraries would have to meet just those essential standards as they would be written in administrative rule to qualify for state funding. So uh, again, uh, those uh, standards are available on the commission website. And maybe Joe or Tracy could drop a link into the chat so you have those there. Sure, I can we've get taken that. Taking into account some, some of the consideration that we've heard about concerns over some of the salary uh, criteria that we've talked about, as well as uh, the hours available for paid staff during library open hours. So you'll see some changes in what was originally proposed reflecting uh, those comments as well. 
the other thing that you'll see in the proposed draft of standards is a standard that does require libraries to continue to uh, improve their library development uh, by looking at enhanced standards. And I'm really excited by a roadmap that we've developed in consultation with the Public Library Standards Task Force that lays out a, a path for libraries to consider when thinking about how you want to consider advancing the services that you're offering to your communities. Again, these are, are not required standards, they're not required for funding, um, but depending on the needs of your community, it gives you an idea of where you might think about continuing to look for ways to improve your services. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a section there that talks about those excellent standards. And then also included in this roadmap is uh, some standards that pertain to collaboration. Uh, in our minds and in thinking about uh, how we can best achieve the outcomes that we're striving for to serve our community, we believe that uh, we can best achieve those outcomes of providing Montanans information sufficient to their needs if we're continuing to collaborate with one another. And so you'll see in the roadmap uh, opportunities for libraries to deepen their collaboration as you think about how you would continue to improve library services. I, I think those are some exciting opportunities. Um, just practically letting you know about what some of the next steps are. Uh, if you think about the previous timeline, we're essentially where we were last February where the commission adopted a set of draft standards uh, in order to move those standards forward into a public comment period. So we'll be taking public comment on this current draft uh, of standards between now and April. And then at the April commission meeting, We'll consider the feedback that we've received during this current public comment period. Um, we'll certainly have the, the task force review those comments as well, make any uh, continued modifications to the standards, and then ask the commission to again take that action on a set of draft standards to move those standards into the administrative rules process so that we can adopt those essential standards into administrative rule. And as I've said before, that process also necessitates a public comment period. So we would leave that public comment period open, um, taking public comment, and then um, ultimately our hope is that the commission will be able to adopt revised standards at their June commission meeting, June of 2021, and then that sets in motion a, a, about a, a year-long period of adoption before libraries would certify that they need these revised standards. Um, Joe's sharing the information about the, the current draft that's available there. Um, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. To be clear, the date by which libraries would then certify that they meet these new standards would be July of 2022, so about a year and a half from now. And Tracy's with us as well. Tracy, if you have anything else you'd like to add, please feel free to jump in. I guess I would just repeat what Jenny said. Um, we will schedule some online meetings, kind of like we did last time, to get your feedback. That was very, very helpful to the Public Library Standards Task Force. So that is on my to-do list to get with Jenny and kind of find some times for us to meet with you and get your feedback. Thanks, Tracy. I also wanted to let you all know that the commission is reviewing 
a revision to the Excellent Library Services Award. Pam Henley has been working with a group of librarians to lead a revision to the criteria that the commission would use to award the ELSA, the Excellent Library Services Award. As you know, that award is tied to the current standards, and so we need to take that into account. We also want to make sure that the ELSA award is meaningful for all types of libraries in addition to public libraries. Um, that draft criteria is also available on the commission website. And again, the commission is considering that now. Uh, they will take action on those revised criteria at their February meeting. So if you have any questions or comments on the revised ELSA criteria uh, between now and then, that would be a, a good time to share your, your feedback with both GC and Pam. Uh, a few more brief updates before we get into some, some more specific discussion. Um, we reached out to the governor's office a few weeks ago uh, about some remaining CARES Act dollars that they were looking to spend. Those dollars have to be spent by the end of this calendar year, so uh, just a couple short weeks from now, and suggested that we might be able to spend some of those dollars on some additional e-resources for all types of libraries. And through that effort, we've been appropriated another $250,000. And so CARE has been taking the lead to look at how best to spend those monies. We've decided to, to split those monies uh, in three, sort of three pots. One to support school libraries, one to support public libraries, and one to support academic libraries, about $80,000 or so for each of those pots in order to make sure that we're best meeting the needs of all types of libraries and all types of Montanans and their user information needs. So um, these are going to be one-time only monies, so we're working to take that into account as we think about how best to use those monies. Um, it may be an opportunity for us to pilot an investment in magazines, for example, but we recognize that with making that kind of one-time only investment uh, that can sometimes put libraries in a difficult place, knowing that we wouldn't necessarily have funding to continue that service. So those are the kinds of things that we're considering as we rapidly work to spend this investment. But I'm really grateful to the governor's office for seeing the need and giving us continued opportunity to invest in e-resources during the, the difficult time of the pandemic. I wanna spend a little time continuing our conversation that we had during our last website chat about the concept of the Montana Library Network. Uh, as I said in November, this is really sort of a nebulous concept uh, where because it's intangible, it's really hard to, to, to think about. It's not something that we can really turn over and, and understand. And so we know for that reason that this is something that we need to continue to talk about at length with the Montana Library community to really help all of you understand what our intent is so that you can provide us the most meaningful feedback possible. Uh, we had a lengthy discussion with the State Library Commission this last Wednesday, and the commission has also had a work session to really understand what we think the Montana Library Network is, what it looks like, what it means for the work of the State Library, and how we work with all of you to deliver services to your patrons. Um, I said to the commission that in our minds, the Montana Library Network is a promise by Montana libraries to their patrons, communities, and to one another to strive together to ensure that all Montanans have information sufficient to your needs. And um, that idea of MLN being a promise is something that is very intangible. It's almost impossible to measure um, is probably pretty hard to see the impact of um, 
And so therefore it's, it's hard to talk about. It becomes a little bit more concrete when we think about MLN as um, a series of core services that libraries are collaborating to deliver to your patrons. And some of those core services are very familiar. They're things like a shared library management system, shared e-resources and e-book platforms, uh, resource sharing, including interlibrary loan, the courier, holds fulfillments, um, a shared cultural resources platform like Montana Memory Project, um, things that we haven't necessarily invested a lot in, in terms of uh, cooperative cataloging or collaborative collection development. But then when we think about Montana Library to Go, um, from the very beginning of Montana Library to Go, we've been doing cooperative collection development. Other core services might be things like scalable programming to support lifelong learning, uh, as is exemplified by our Ready to Read program, the Maker Kit program that we've offered in the past, the new uh, entrepreneur training and economic development program that Amelia is working on. Other core services might include things like internet access and access to technology resources. It might include uh, shared data and metrics to help us talk about the impact that library services have in our communities, as well as shared marketing and publicity. Those are all things that we know when we collaborate together, when we share our knowledge and expertise, as well as our resources, the end result are better services, more robust services that leverage our resources more effectively to offer to our patrons to help meet their information needs. As I said, many of these services are services that we're already offering, but we don't necessarily think about these services as they relate to one another. Uh, our approach to administering these kinds of services, our approach to engaging the library community to help advise us on how we advance these services is done very much in silos. And we think that there's a significant need for us to begin to think about how these kinds of services interrelate to one another um, to make sure that when we're looking at an information need in our community, that we're thinking about it from all aspects of library services, not just, for example, how a technology solution might address a need. Um, there may be opportunities for us to think also about how we're investing financially in a problem or bringing our collective understanding of the problem to bear to solve them. So there's a, a real opportunity for us to think across these different kinds of services in order to uh, help us better plan for and address the information needs in our communities. What I, what I think is important about the message that the Montana Library Network is a promise is that it's inclusive of all of our libraries and it doesn't leave any library out. I don't want to think about the Montana Library Network as something that a library is a member of or not, that a library might be able to afford to be a member or not. I think we all have the ability to commit in different ways at different levels to supporting one another collaboratively and then in turn benefiting our communities through that collaboration. And so I think that's really what's important for you to think about when you're thinking about what the Montana Library Network is for you. For the commission and for the state library, as we really identify and articulate what these core services are, that means for us that 
those services are where the state library invests our financial resources and our staff expertise to support. And when we're investing our resources and you're also investing your financial resources in those core services, we're best leveraging our resources to deliver those services to our patrons. But that doesn't mean that a library would have to necessarily participate in or benefit from every single one of the core services. Simply that by collaborating to the extent that it makes sense in your communities, you'll be best leveraging the resources that you have for your patrons. And it also raises opportunities for you to think about uh, where you might be able to refer patrons to other libraries or to take advantage of services from other libraries to meet your uh, community's information needs. Also from the State Library's perspective, we're giving careful thought to how we organize the advisory and executive groups that currently exist to best leverage their interest as well as expertise to help us really define what these core services are, uh, think about the impacts that we want them to have in our communities, how we measure their success, we want groups that can help us plan for the future, to think about what these services look like across all Montanans and all types of libraries, we want groups of people that can advise us on what the current pandemic means for delivery of these kinds of services and they can help us plan for, for future disasters. Um, we see this potentially playing out through our network advisory council in a, a slimmer, leaner network advisory council whose job is to really define what those core services are that we should focus on and to help us think about um, how we measure the success of those services. And then we envision perhaps subcommittees and task forces of subject matter experts for each of those core services that meet regularly, even if it's just once a year, to help answer some key questions about those services specifically, like measurements of success, how they relate to other core services, again, delivery of those services to all Montanans, thinking about what Montanans are not currently being served and so forth. Uh, those groups would, in essence, be subcommittees of the Network Advisory Council, advising the NAC, who would in turn advise the State Library and the State Library Commission. There's important work that's currently being done by the existing advisory and executive committees that work hard to support the Montana Shared Catalog and Montana Library to Go and other groups. Um, so our next step in thinking about the Montana Library Network is to meet with them to get their input on the work that they're currently doing that we can't forget about, that we can't leave behind and to understand their feedback about what their roles look like and, and how they might best shape the Montana Library Network. From there, we planned to take that feedback to the current Network Advisory Council to continue to refine and define what we mean by the Montana Library Network. Um, if we're ready, we can take some recommendations to the Commission in February there's more questions to answer about what MLN might be, might delay that process a little bit. I don't think we're in a, a specific rush to do this kind of work. But practically speaking, the, the action from the commission, if we continue down this path, would be to uh, reshape the advisory groups that work with the State Library to be more focused on uh, what I've described and the, the outcomes that we seek. And then as we're thinking about how we invest our dollars to really begin investing them in these core services specifically. Um, and then from there in the future, we, we 
we have ample opportunity to think about how these core services are shaped, uh, how we continue to think about them for the future, things like what the costs are so we can adequately fundraise um, and talk to the legislature and other funding bodies about trying to get additional funding for them, continuing to think about new technologies, new service models, how we continue to think about reshaping library services in the future. I'm going to stop talking there and again ask if there's any questions, comments, feedback for me. Again, staff, feel free to weigh in as well. The chat box has been mostly staff posting a few things. So, well, entirely actually. So, no questions there. Um, Maybe give people a couple seconds to bring in. You certainly are welcome to unmute yourself and jump into the conversation. That'd be great. The time we have left, I did want to share some updates about what we know and, and a lot about what we don't know about the upcoming legislative session. It's currently scheduled to start on January 4th. The legislature has not yet decided exactly what the makeup of the session is going to look like with regard to how they handle the pandemic. The rules committees have been meeting, they met a couple of times this last week, and then they're supposed to vote next week on the 16th about whether or not they'll have an in-person session or a hybrid session. I think it's still on the table to push the session back until the vaccine is available, although uh, that approach isn't receiving a lot of support from the majority party. Um, we hope also to get more information on what it will look like to testify before the legislature, what opportunities we'll have to do that remotely, uh, if in fact they do have an in-person or a hybrid session. Um, we're also looking for guidance on how we might engage with the legislature differently because of the pandemic. As I think I've said, the State Library is not going to host an in-person open house as we've always done with the Montana Library Association and the State Library during the pandemic. Um, so we'll be looking for online ways to engage with the legislature uh, early in the session. Uh, and then throughout the session, we're also having conversations with the Montana Library Association Government Affairs Committee about what those opportunities might look like. Um, so we're, we're really waiting for the legislature to make some decisions so that we can really finalize some of that kind of planning. Uh, in terms of the state library budget, the governor did release his budget in November, and then we're waiting for a final revision that will be due on Tuesday. And my understanding is that that will reflect some of the budget priorities of Governor-elect Jean Forte as well. So I'm anxious to see what that budget looks like. Um, a couple of things in the budget I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. Um, it continues um, to include some increased funding for the state library, specifically for our digital library services, uh, a fairly modest amount of increased funding there. Uh, and then also, it's not directly in the House Bill 2 budget for the state library, but would pass through the state library budget is a planned increase in your public library state aid. Um, you all know that the state aid is tied to the decennial census, and so as soon as we have that official census count, we'll know exactly how much increased funding to anticipate for state aid in the next year. Um, there's at least one federal lawsuit that might delay the release of that official count. Uh, it is due at the end of this month, but again, that might be delayed. So. Um, as soon as we know what that new population is, we'll be able to calculate the total amount that will be available for state aid. And then I think it's in 
April that we're supposed to get information on how that total census count is allocated across the counties in Montana. And it's that information that we need in order to tell each individual library what your new state aid amount will be. So two pieces of information that we're waiting for there. Um, but in terms of the legislature, there is a placeholder in the budget for an increase in state aid. Um, right now, that increase reflects a population increase of about 50,000. We think it's going to be higher, but we need to, to wait for, for that official amount uh, count to move forward. And then we'll make sure that we get that um, placeholder amount updated to what the official dollar amount should be. We don't have to take any kind of legislative activity on state aid this year. Um, it's, it's simply the increase tied to the decennial census. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that legislators continue to be aware of the importance of that funding to all of your libraries. So we'll have information about what state aid is, um, how it passes through the state library budget. Uh, we have some impact stories from your libraries. Um, you have more current, more up-to-date stories about how you spend your state aid dollars uh, that you want to share with state library staff. That would be fantastic. Think about um, what those stories might be that you might share with your local legislators as well. Um, and then you've heard me talk about a couple pieces of legislation that are going to move through the legislative process coming out of the interim study this last year that looked at the state library's budget. Um, one ties 911 funding to the GIS work that we do to support local government addressing and transportation data. And then the second would be an increase to the recordation fee that supports our Land Information Act work, um, some additional GIS funding as well as funding for the MLIA grants that go to your local communities. So we'll be working with legislators and stakeholders to shepherd those two pieces of legislation forward. And we hope that, that those might have a opportunity for a fairly significant increase in the state library budget. And then the final piece of legislation that we're working on in concert with the Montana Library Association is a broadband study resolution that if passed would call for an interim study next interim to, of the legislature to look at the broadband needs in the state of Montana. So the study itself would be conducted by the legislature. Uh, the study would be assigned to a legislative interim committee. They would put staff resources towards conducting the study. The resolution itself outlines why broadband is important, why now we need to be focusing on it. And it sets out some guideposts for some things that we think need to be studied, like what is adequate broadband? Uh, how can public and private sectors work together to support broadband? How might we best fund broadband? Who should be responsible in the state for coordinating broadband efforts and so forth? We're going to be meeting with a wide group of stakeholders uh, this next Tuesday the 15th who are um, talking together about what this study resolution should look like. Broadband from a legislative perspective is something that's been very, very contentious in past years, which is why we haven't seen a lot of legislative activity to support enhancing broadband in the state. Uh, our hope is that um, there's enough agreement amongst the stakeholders that we should put resources into studying the issue and come out with some legislative recommendations for next session that we can at least move this resolution forward Next interim, it would mean that all of those contentious issues would have to be ironed out in order to come up with some comprehensive legislation moving forward. Now is not the time to have those debates. Um, this uh, study resolution isn't intended to resolve those debates. It's simply intended to create the framework for the study for those debates to occur. And we hope that the end result would be comprehensive broadband legislation hopefully including an investment of funding from the state of Montana.
So those are the efforts that we're really going to be monitoring in the upcoming legislative session. There is one thing related to the state library budget that I forgot to mention. Um, you all know that we receive whole severance tax monies right now that fund things like the Federation payments. Um, we've used them in the past to fund the statewide databases that went away when that uh, funding source proved to be so volatile. They fund a number of other uh, statewide projects and, and services that we offer. Um, because of the volatility of that funding source, and I, I think um, none of us have any real confidence that it's going to be a, a long-term viable revenue source for the state, the Governor's Budget Office is proposing to move that source of funding off of the coal severance tax onto the general fund. Um, and then there would be companion legislation that would take the state library out of the distribution of the, the coal severance tax dollars. Uh, I approach this change with some trepidation because we've had obviously some cuts to our general fund in recent history. Um, but at the same time, we're facing deeper and deeper cuts to our coal severance tax revenue. Uh, this year, for example, our appropriation is $560,000 in coal severance tax dollars, but we're only anticipating receiving about $430,000 in actual cash. So when we created our budget this year, it was assuming that we were going to be short about $130,000, $140,000, which is really unfortunate um, because, of course, we could do a lot of good work with that funding. We're not in a position where we have to cut anything because we've planned for it, um, but uh, managing that kind of volatility in our budget is very difficult and it certainly means that we're not able to commit to ongoing services in any meaningful way for all of you. Uh, so in the long run, I think that uh, a, a move to general fund, it's necessary. I think it's necessary to get us off full severance tax fund. Like I said, it comes with some risk, um, but the risk to staying on coal, I think, long-term is far greater. Again, those are the, the priorities that we're focusing on as we go into the legislative session. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions. A comment in the uh, chat box was uh, from Jennifer Desh from Imagine If. She wondered that she said she heard that um, there is more funding coming through CenturyLink to expand broadband in Montana. Could you comment about that? Sure. So there was a major announcement this week uh, about some federal investment in broadband. Um, I think it was about $126 million that is coming to Montana uh, through CenturyLink and some other companies. Um, I don't think those companies have a lot of details yet on uh, where and how they plan to invest those dollars for broadband build out. I do hope that that means that they'll be uh, investing in broadband, especially in currently un unserved areas and underserved areas. Uh, and that's a, a great step. It, it's, it's very necessary. Um, when we think about broadband in Montana, investing in actual capital deployment of broadband as these funds would do is, is a critical necessary step. Uh, there's some other needs as well. Uh, I liken the broadband landscape to a patchwork quilt where we have um, opportunities like this federal funding that you're referring to, Jennifer, uh, we have things like E-rate dollars and other sources of universal ser service dollars uh, that are part of the mix because they can help make broadband more affordable. Um, right now, we're not investing any state monies either on broadband deployment or broadband affordability. Um, and what's significantly missing in Montana right now is a coordinating entity who is looking out to all of those opportunities Jenny, that can pull that. You just got really quiet. Together. Was there a question? Yeah, I couldn't hear part of what oh, you were sorry. saying now. It, it got way quiet. 
Is that better? A little. Yeah. Oh. Just. Sorry about that. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Yeah, that's better. You lean in a little bit. I think that's all you okay. need. Sounds good. So uh, what I was saying is uh, we need a coordinating entity in Montana that's looking out for all of these kinds of opportunities to make sure that we're, we're best leveraging that federal investment where it's most needed and uh, where federal investment might not reach. You can think about state investment. It's really important for us to think about affordability. Um, you all know how expensive broadband is in your libraries. And there should be opportunities for us to drive down cost through E-rate or other kinds of um, policies and, and, and different kinds of mechanisms. We wanna make sure that we're addressing needs like education and telemedicine. Uh, that's what we hope might be studied through this broadband study bill. So in addition to just the actual lane of fiber, how can we address these other concerns really proactively? And then if we look at models from other states, um, states who've invested heavily in broadband, they're really now focusing on broadband adoption. How do you get people really invested in digital literacy? So lots of opportunity for us to think about the future of broadband and technology in Montana. Other questions or comments? All right, well, I thank you all very much for joining me and I wish you all a very happy and safe holiday season. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop our recording here. Just a moment, but we will stick around just